Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, John Cameron, the author of uh, one of those two books? Uh, Rewire. Rewire and Rekill. Rekill. And the brand new Aristocracy yes. coming out later this fall. Uh, it should be in time for Christmas presents. And uh, Devon Minima, who is a, a city councilman in Dixon since uh, last uh, November. Congratulations on your electoral victory. Well, absolutely. Thank you, Richard. Thanks for having me on. And we're talking tonight, uh, well, we're, we're on, obviously, Channel 17, uh, or if you're watching in Sacramento. Uh, other channels, if you're watching elsewhere around the cable universe, and, of course, uh, on the web at www.accesssacramento.org, 8 p.m. Thursday, 4 a.m. on uh, uh, Saturday morning and noon on Friday. That's my favorite time, 4 a.m. That's when I get most of my libertarian counterpoint watching done. Actually, I'm watching C-SPAN morning Washington Journal at that time. <laughs> but, uh, you know, everybody has their own taste. Different yes. strokes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, it, it, Jeff Sessions can't seem to get out of the news, and usually for all of the wrong reasons. Jeff, Jeff Sessions has done, has announced a new civil asset <coughs> forfeiture guidelines uh, for uh, basically beefing up and going after doing civil asset forfeiture with a vengeance. So much so that he is going to ignore local, city, and state uh, rules on civil civil asset uh, forfeiture. In other words, he's just going to say. California, you don't think it should be done this way? We don't care. We're the feds. We're going to do it anyway. Uh, he's, he's reversing the only thing, the only one good thing that Attorney General Eric Holder ever did. Absolutely. No, and you know what, what drives me crazy about this is that there are so many, there were so many people out there during this election cycle that, that you know, voted for Trump and, and still have this ironclad belief that that his administration and and his actions are going to, you know, fantastically benefit us. And this just shows that I don't think the president understands the ramifications that his cabinet picks make and the actual policies and how they affect what goes on throughout the country. Civil asset forfeiture is, is it, it's... Uh, it's uh, highway robbery, literal, exactly. literal highway robbery by the cops. Yeah. More money is stolen by police forces across the country through civil asset forfeiture than is stolen by burglaries across the country. Literally, more money is being yeah. stolen by the by the police officers than by the crooks, which kind of begs the definition. Exactly. So uh, on civil asset forfeiture, if people aren't familiar with it. Um, Police can can take assets, and your they, car, your money, yeah. your house. Your car, your money, and money's a favorite, and uh, the asset is somehow uh, a, a criminal. Uh, so, if for example, it, it can go to these ri ri ridiculous extents, um, extent this ridiculous extent. You can um, own a house, and it can be empty, and people can squat in it and and have a meth lab. And uh, because the meth lab was in your home, that, that home is now a criminal, and it is seized. And, and you can't get it back. You can't get it but back. But it's not, it's, not it's not even, you don't have to be proved. No you, you crime has to, to be, be proved. You can be stopped for the proverbial. Or even arrested. You can be stopped for the proverbial taillight yeah. uh, uh, violation, and they'll say, can I search your car? Never say yes. Can I search your car? Well, my dog alerted. We're going to take your car. Mm. or we're going to take the cash in your wallet. Mm. And you have to prove a negative. You have to prove that you are not involved in the drug trade or, in the, cash was not or in the child trafficking trade or mm. whatever they mm. accuse you of. You don't have to, they're not going to charge you criminally. There's no criminal charges. They just mm. take your stuff mm. and say, you know, so, uh, so long, goodbye, thank right. you. So well, maybe not thank you. Can, can, um, can a citizen... Uh, when they see an egregious example of uh, illegal activity, such as a cop carrying a massive amount of cash, which is obviously a kickback or a bribe, <laughs> could a citizen um, take the cash from the cop? You know the answer to that. You know the interesting thing <laughs> to me. The interesting thing to me about this is that Trump is now not happy with Sessions. 
but it has nothing to do with civil asset forfeiture. He's ignoring that entirely. He's, he's mad at Sessions because <coughs> Sessions did not recuse himself has or recused. has recused himself on the whole Russia investigation, mm -hmm. the whole Russia under every bed uh, allegations being put out by the Democratic Party. Uh, and of course, as a result of that recusal, recusal uh, the, uh, uh, there was a, a special counsel. Was, special uh, prosecutor. Special prosecutor, Sorry. special counsel. I think a special counsel, the special, special prosecutor. Special counsel. Yeah, special prosecutor law expired. Mueller, Robert Mueller, is the guy that uh, was appointed and just came out today that he is going to broaden the investigation. It was supposed to be just about Russia. Well, Mueller has decided he's got a, basically a, a license to investigate anything he feels like. Uh, remember Ken, uh, what was his name? The, Ken Starr. Uh, he basically investigated whatever he wanted to. Well, the same thing is happening with a vengeance. Uh, on the other side of the aisle now. So Hillary's going to be under investigation now? No, no, anything to do with Trump. Oh, just uh, Trump. Yeah, just Trump. Doesn't make any, any difference any, any difference whether it has to do with Russia or not. Well, sort of. I mean, uh, evidently, uh, Trump had dealings in a Miss America contest some 10, 15 years ago there, where there was a Russian contest, so that's fair game. Uh, he uh, has had business dealings, or his family has had business dealings, sold condos in Trump Tower, to uh, Russian expats, so mm -hmm. that's fair game. Mm -hmm. They're going to go over every business deal he's had that has anything to do with Russia mm -hmm. for for his, basically his entire. So any caviar he's eaten, that'll be probably. Yeah. And here's yeah. the thing: with three felonies a day, they're going to find something. Oh yeah. There, it's impossible for them not to find something, whether it's anything other than, you know, Mickey Mouse silly stuff is debatable. But the, the interesting thing is this: I don't think the Democrats actually want to impeach Trump. Trump is too good of a fundraiser for them. Mm. Trump is the perfect lightning rod to rile up the, the donor base to uh, send money to the Democrats to uh, defeat this evil, vile uh, man uh, in, the, in the presidency. They don't want him gone. They sure as heck don't want the mild-mannered uh, Mike Pence there because Pence is kind of a hard target to go after. Mm -hmm. He doesn't do, he doesn't make all of the the uh, the blunderbuss mistakes that Trump does, mm. and so they don't want Pence as, as president. Well, I, they don't want I that don't at want all. Pence as president either. Well, so. exactly. But <laughs> I can see from the Democrats from the Democratic standpoint, they would much rather have Trump in there so that, yeah. that they can pillory than Pence, who would be able to defend himself. Well, well, you know, there's only one problem with that. They wanted Trump as the candidate so much that they actually gave him some money, uh, yeah. and and uh, they gave him all that free publicity because they thought. Uh, laughing he, he boy be would be easy pickings, and their poll showed that any of the standard um, Republican presidential candidates, the top two or three, would beat Hillary by by double digits. So they they, in essence, put uh, Trump in office. Yeah, the whole thing about RussiaGate is that Hillary actually took money. Money came from Russian uh, interests into the Clinton Foundation in return. The uh, she is Secretary of State gave uranium mining concessions to the yeah. Russians, Absolutely. and that's that's fact. Yeah, there is quid pro quo going on in the Clinton camp. Uh, Mueller, exactly. did you? If you're listening, which you aren't, um, <laughs> but uh, if you are, that's something to go after. Yeah. So Absolutely. anyway, but the whole thing about a special counsel is because they have carte blanche and because everybody's guilty of multiple everything, you know, some things, mm -hmm. they're going to find something, and this might blow up in their face. They might end up having to have an impeachment vote. It, you know, I don't think it'll convict, not in the Senate, but, uh, you know, with it controlled by Republicans, and they probably may even not get the impeachment. You never know, though, that people like Murkowski and, and those, uh, Susan Collins, they may be able to get an indictment, uh, an actual impeachment, whether they get him out of office, I doubt very much, but it might blow up in their face, because they'll find something. Uh, even though there's really nothing to the story there's no there in, there. in substance. Yeah. Well, and that's the gambit. When you have a special counsel, they will get into anything and everything. And they'll find you them. let them. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, and, and they've by appointing them, it's, you're letting them. Exactly. Um, there's a guy uh, who just wrote an article in U.S. News and World Report. So this is, you know, a weekly news magazine. This is mm -hmm. not... Uh, not the uh, the Huffington Post or something or fake news. This is a, you know a long established mm -hmm. uh, weekly news magazine. The guy's name is Matt Meyer. He wrote a book or a, an article advocating that the United States declare war on Mexico in order to win the drug war. 
Now keep in mind, this is a guy who was a uh, Department of Homeland Security official during the George W. Bush administration. So you've got a, a member of, the former, of a former administration actually talking about declaring war, physical war, real war, on a neighboring country to win an unwinnable drug war. Well, it would be, there, there would be some benefit to declaring war on Mexico. Um, I can't for the life of me think that. No, I'm, um, he, he has stated that he, that he doesn't want to actually declare war on, on the government and people of Mexico, but he wants to uh, use the, the might of the military to declare the, 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 the war on the, on the drug trade in Mexico. So if we follow... So he's going to uh, send in the Marines to go after, yeah, to go uh, after Pablo? To, yes, to go after uh, the drug kingpins, to, uh, to ruin the crops, to uh, break up the supply chain. He really did that in Colombia for quite some time. Um, it didn't work out Yeah, well, so. it didn't work. It didn't, didn't work very well. But, you know, the problem here again is follow the money. And, and in this case, I'm not being cynical. I, I firmly believe that um, drugs are legal in this country, uh, it's a heinous crime because so many people benefit and some pretty evil people benefit from drugs being illegal. The, the, you have a, a victim class um, that uh, the liberals get to take care of. They, they're a huge bureaucracy of welfare and, and all the other things Drug they do. Drug rehabilitation. Drug rehab wouldn't be there. Uh, corrections officers wouldn't have draw jobs. The Something like 50 percent of our of our prison population is every kind of drug. It's, it's more like 70 percent. And if you if you get an honest police chief, they will tell you that the real problem with uh, making drugs legal is not that it would cause problems, but that it would they would have to slash payrolls. That's because they wouldn't problem. have anything to do. They wouldn't have anything to do. Hmm. Um, and. You run a police yeah. force in, in, in Dixon. Do you find that the police force there is spending an inordinate amount of time going after victimless crimes? Absolutely. And, you know, right now in Dixon, there, there's, uh, well, as much as any part, any part of the country, there's been a huge influx of heroin and, and other um, narcotics. And so, and in fact, one of the things, just to echo one of your points, I heard um, that Narcan, the uh, revival drug that sh uh, shuts off the neurostimulators um, basically brings you back after you've OD'd, right? In some cases, that costs up to $4,500 a shot, right? So the drug companies are profiting not only on the front end by, you know, essentially getting people addicted to the point that they can't afford, you know, to have, to have access to drugs. And then on the back end, again, by you know, funding or by uh, selling the way to save them. I heard about one lady over in uh, uh, West Virginia was revived 13 times in a matter of one month. You know, at some point, it's it's going to bankrupt our, our, our public services and our first responders. Mm. You know, it, it's absurd. Well, the, the opposite side of that coin, or, or maybe part of that coin, is that we had a um, kind of a very loose policy maybe even appropriately loose policy, um, where lots of doctors were writing lots of scripts for, mm -hmm. for Norco and all the rest of that stuff. And then they tightened that up. So they got a bunch of people addicted to pain meds um, and then uh, withdrew their supply. Where are they going to go? They're addicts. They're going to go find drugs somewhere. So I'm not saying that was intentional, but it's certainly the, the perceived unintended consequence is a whole people, a whole lot of people who were getting uh, medication to take care of their addiction that was in essence caused by, you know, loose prescription writing, uh, paid for in many cases by their health insurance, so their costs were or by so Medicare they, and Medicaid, yeah, Medicare and Medicaid, so they didn't have to do any crime, and they still have the addiction, but now the ability to manage it through asking their doctor for some for more Vicodin is gone. What do they have to do? They have to go deal with criminals, they have to, uh, if they didn't have any money before, they have to generate money, and that deals with crime, fraud, embezzlement, uh, all Hold the other street crime smuggling, you know, the whole, yeah. Yeah, the whole yeah, exactly. yeah. And that's so, what leads to that whole cost on, on public services and, and our police, uh, police departments, especially, you know, 
especially nowadays. It's just escalating faster and faster. What percentage of the uh, policing cost would you say is uh, dealing with uh, victimless crimes as opposed to dealing with murder, you know, uh, violent crime? I, I honestly wouldn't be comfortable putting a number on it, but yeah. it, it is a significant chunk. Absolutely, yeah. most of the things, and especially in a small town like Dixon, we're not dealing with you know murders and and you know stick you're not up Chicago. robberies. <laughs> exactly. yeah, you, you don't you don't have that many uh, abductions and, and exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, in California, the uh, the uh, politicians, the uh, almost uh, hundred, well, the the majority Democratic uh, Assembly and Senate have reinstated cap and trade. It's been reauthorized for another, I don't know, eight, ten years. Who benefits, who loses? Well, um, politicians benefit, first of all, it's a, it's a huge billions of dollars of revenue. Uh, who loses is uh, any small business because large businesses have the ability to, to weather the storm. If you're a trucker, or they're written out. What? Or they're written out. They get special exemptions. Yeah. They don't have to follow well, the rules. Well, for yeah, the uh, yeah, agricultural industry got on the recent thing an exemption. But what there was a there was a recent case uh, where um, the uh, circuit court found that uh, um, this the money generated from cap and trade wasn't a fee and wasn't a tax, and it's a, a new special kind of revenue, neither fee nor tax. I call it a fleece, a uh, combination <laughs> of flea and uh, tax and, and fee. And um, the, the problem is, is that, you know, like Obamacare, once you, you know, once they get a taste of that money, they're going to want that money. Mm -hmm. But the, who's really suffered tremendously are uh, small trucking organizations, uh, people, small construction organizations. Um, and until recently, small farmers, but still uh, loggers, anybody that, that um, you know, needs to move something from A to B that, that <coughs> doesn't have a fleet of 100 trucks. Um, and and the, the, even some of the craziness associated with, with the new air quality rules, much less the cap and trade, is that um, the things they're forcing people to use to, to bring um, their vehicles up to standard, don't work, and, and kill their vehicles, and they basically have to go buy, go buy new ones. So perhaps there's a hidden driver there. But what really upsets me is that in order to, to get this thing done, um, they, they wrote some deals uh, that really um, benefited uh, Western growers, ag, and, and some other folks. And, and, you Chamber know, of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce and that, the, but not the National Federation of Independent Small Businesses. No, small businesses are getting killed, like they like a, they got killed in Obamacare, like they get they get killed in everything. Um, but, you know, these are proud individualists, and they're the ones that get hit most. I uh, raise money for for Pacific Legal Foundation. I talked to a guy that used to be a donor, and and he uh, told me his story. Um, it took about thirty minutes to tell about how, in essence, the changes in air quality rules even before the cap and trade craziness uh, ruined him, drove him out of business, ruined his business, and he employed a lot of people and generated a lot of tax revenue, and he just couldn't come up with the money to keep up. You know, first his stationary equipment was gone, then his trucks were gone, and then his business was gone. And so if I'm talking to one guy that that's happening to, then there's thousands of guys. And those are the people, the, the backbone of this country has always been the small business that grows into a large business, the person that starts out with one truck, like the guy that started morning start packing, driving one truck, and then he's got a multi-million dollar business that benefits thousands of people because of hard work. But if you kill off those small businesses, where does that seed enterprise come from? It's gone. Mm -hmm. Well, it's there, is, gone. there is one uh, benefit, which is very ironic. It's mm -hmm. high-speed rail, getting $800 million. Last time I looked, Choo-choo trains put out carbon. Well, this one puts out methane because oh, it's I full see. of crap. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's West Sacramento. They're getting $150 million for streetcars. Yeah. I'm sorry, streetcars in West Sacramento? Where are they going to go? Up and down the up and down the stroll? I don't I don't get it. I um, scam, scam and more scam. Yeah, it's uh, who's who's slicing money off of that? Who's getting the little backsheesh? See, and in, in other countries, they're honest enough to call it bribed, kickbacks, backsheesh. 
Um, in our country, we call it permits. Uh, so, <laughs> permit uh, yeah. is when yeah. is when uh, the the government takes away your right to earn a living and then sells it back to you. Sells it back exactly. to you. Yeah. 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 Uh, in you know, and that's, it's a profitable business, and it's most profitable uh, in Washington D.C. A recent study came out that indicated that uh, the the Washington D.C. metro area has one half of the nation's ten richest counties. And it's not because they're producing steel or agricultural products or uh, data bits or anything we, we can use. It's because they are, uh, well, like Panem, the uh, capital of the Hunger Games. They are, they are bringing in a whole lot more in, uh, well, we call it revenue, but I call it pilferage, than they're, than they're putting back out. Everyone jokes about how is this swamp, and, but it, it's true. There's absolutely no uh, geographical benefits to D.C. Uh, it is literally the, the center where all of our tax, flow, tax dollars are flowing to, and we're only getting pennies back out. You know, All that money is, is circulating, and it's incredible how, uh, you know, I, I grew up and I always thought Sacramento was, you know, the, the big city, and then I found out that San Francisco is the big city, and then... Then I went to D.C. and I found out that D.C. is, nope, that's where everything is. Because but it's got field offices all over the country. I, to, I just uh, sidetrack. I, today I decided to get my $10 National Park Senior Citizen uh, Lifetime Pass for $10. It's going up to $80 at the end of the month or something. How old do you have to be to do this? You have to be 65. Man, and so, uh, <laughs> so I go out. I, so I go to the Bureau of Land Management. I never knew this place existed, but there's a Bureau of Land Management office in Sacramento. It must be. It must be three city blocks. I mean, this place is huge. I'm not sure if it's all BLM, but it's all federal offices. So, and I had to go through security to get oh, yeah. in. Armed security. Huh? Armed security. I don't know if those were, you know, the metal uh, yeah, detector, metal detector, yeah. the whole, you know, the conveyor belt with, uh, you yeah. know, examining my shoes and whatnot. The the person in front of me, she was not happy about it at all, yeah. because she didn't want she didn't want the the wand. But I mean, you know, and we're, we're we're being subjected to kneel and obey by security officers in public buildings, federal buildings at least, and for that matter, county buildings and state buildings. Uh, you know, we're, we're being taught to be subservient. Uh, it's even in the hinterlands, even here so, in Sacramento. So what, what, are, what are they worried that you're going to steal at uh, no, I think they're, they're, they're worried I'm going to, I don't know, bring in explosives or something. Whatever, you know, they're, they're worried about a Timothy McVeigh incident, I guess. Ah, mm -hmm. so, okay. Who knows? Uh, Elon Musk says that AI, artificial intelligence, is uh, a fundamental risk this is a quote, an actual quote. A fundamental risk to human civilization. Artificial intelligence, we're talking about robots, we're talking about automation, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, advocates of Open AI, it's an organization he's uh, funded and is a member of, uh, are, are, I'm wondering, are they looking for government support? Elon Musk is really, really good at getting government support for all of his various projects. Well, his, his billions uh, that he's made off of Tesla or, you know, government grants and loans to build his business, to fund his business, he's probably the best government um, money <coughs> hustler around other than maybe Al Gore. Um, I think maybe even Al Gore is lower down as far as the dollars he's managed to steal from uh, the taxpayer to finance his business, so he's really good at it. Um, I'm... Um, I think that, that the problem uh, is, is, again, one of control. There's a number of people, I mean, IBM is working heavily on AI. I think Intel's working heavily on it. Apple's working heavily on it. They're, they're, Google. Um, yeah. Google's working on it. And, and you know, the, now that uh, I think the first quantum computer for commercial use is just around the corner, it just happened. Um, you know, what it is, is is kind of the Luddite thing. They're fearful of change and everything else, but what they're most fearful of is they're, they're not in there controlling the way this thing's going. And, it's and gonna, they want to be in It's going to completely upset their apple cart. So let's say art, the, the massive quantum computing artificial intelligence takes a look at one of the, one of the pet things for, um, for the... Uh, um, the liberals, especially, uh, 
global warming and, and one of these artificial intelligence has the computing power to actually take in all the data it needs to spit out a really good formula and it says sunspots. It doesn't say CO2, it says sunspots. And um, so all of a sudden you've got something that is not subjective, uh, that's not politicized, giving you information. So well, you, you can't control it and you can't spin it unless you write the code to control and spin it like Google does with its right. search terms. But, um, so, th you know, that's frightening. Well, the other thing is, I mean, you mentioned the Luddites. The Luddites uh, were, a guy by the name of Ludd was upset because uh, uh, silk spinners were mm -hmm. being put out of business by the invention of the loom, mm -hmm. which would... I think it was wool. Was it, wasn't it wool? Was wool, it? yeah, maybe it was wool. Anyway, some, some kind of cloth. cloth. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. the looms were going to destroy jobs in the uh, silks or in the spinning industry, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and and it did. But of course, it created a whole lot more jobs by making it possible for people other than the aristocracy to wear nice clothes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it lowered the price of clothing so that everybody could wear wear more than you know three shirts and or one shirt, and you know wash it overnight. So. Yeah, the, the whole idea, once a year. Yeah, yeah. the whole idea, the whole idea <laughs> that that machines will take people's jobs is absolute economic poppycock. Let me give you an, a, just a, a real world contemporary example. We work now for most people a thirty five hour week, maybe forty. My grandfather, only two generations ago, worked a eighty hour week, twelve hours a day, seven days a week, sun up to sundown took four hours off on Sunday to drive his horse and buggy into town to go to church. And I am not exaggerating. That's the amount of time it took to farm 160 acres. Now, that same farmer can work 10 or 20 hours a week with automated equipment and you know, multiple row equipment and so forth. Minimal till uh, minimum tillage uh, practices and, and, good, and farm thousands, farm uh, thousands of acres crops. and spend and spend and spend the winter in uh, in in uh, the Bahamas. It's <laughs> it's it's changed, and and the amount of production has gone up quantum. I mean, when I was a kid, we were growing. Well, my grandfather was a kid. You know, fifty dollar fifty bushels an acre in a Midwest corn crop was good. Now it's two or three hundred bushels an acre with a whole lot less input. That's all automation, that's all artificial intelligence, it's all automation, and it's all good because we're all eating a lot more as witnessed by our obesity uh, and doing it talking about? And, and yeah. spending a lot less. So the point is, there is, there is an, there's an unending demand for goods and services that will never change. Humans always want more and always want more leisure as well. So there's nothing to fear from artificial intelligence. Cal, that's a scary. Thank you very much. We'll be again. We'll be what about again. the Terminator? We'll be back again next week. Same time, same place on the Libertarian Channel.